if a patient is progressing, okay, we um, can now use ruxolitinib. But let's step back and, and ask the question, Rami, why? I mean, why is it important? Why is JAK2 an important target in polycythemia vera? Yeah. Obviously, as, as we discussed earlier, like the, the JAK stat pathway overactivation, whether it's from the mutation or ligand overactivation for the pathway, is the hallmark for all those diseases. And the APO signaling is obviously through JAK stat pathway. And in majority of patients with PVR, the, the, the mutation is there, the pathway is overactivated. So uh, it makes sense to test you know, the JAK2 inhibitors in that setting. And in addition, things that we also are common features of those diseases, like in PVR patients that had, you know, splenomegaly, uh, that had like pruritus and other things, uh, which ruxolitinib had proven to be very effective in patients with myelofibrosis, could be utilized for those patients. So based on all of that, there had been obviously a randomized clinical trial in patients that are resistant or intolerant to hydria, where they randomized to best available therapy versus ruxolitinib. The primary endpoint was a composite endpoint of the spleen and the hematocrit control that was defined on the study based on eligibility for phlebotomy. And the study showed that the, it met the primary endpoint, the composite one. Uh, it showed better control of or a higher rate of complete hematological responses. Um, so that, that's the benefit. So patients that had required multiple phlebotomies, I think their hematocrit control was better. Uh, I think from my point in clinical practice, there is really benefit for symptom control, as Serge was indicating, you know, patients that have splenomegaly or pruritus. You don't get that control with, with uh, the best available therapy. Uh, when you look more in the study, although it was not powered for that, it looked at things like thrombotic events. It looked like they are less, but that was not the aim of the study by any means. Then a very important point I think Serge raised is looking at secondary malignancies. It also looked like they were less. Uh, again, not aimed to look at that. So, so there are like so many benefits, obviously, or rationale to use it in terms of hitting the goals, the biology, the, the control, the side effects. I, I think what we lack a little bit is also will be the long-term use of those medications. Like, you know, somebody who's 25 and you put on roxetinib for 20 or 30 years. We don't have data on that. And that's what I tell my younger patients sometimes, that I don't have long-term data on, on the safety. So, and In the response trial, you're right. They had to have both palpable, they had a palpable splenomegaly and a, a, a large spleen by MRI and also a phlebotomy requirement. Um, and so it was a composite endpoint. But then there was response two, where you didn't have to have splenomegaly. And what I, what I was uh, um, uh, took note of is that the rate of uh, hematocrit control, as well as the number of phlebotomies, however you look at that, was um, better with um, ruxolitinib compared to best available therapy. And the responses were almost identical to those responses in response one. Um, and again, also there in response Two, um, there were fewer thrombotic events, although the numbers are quite low, there were th fewer thrombotic events over this period of time in the ruxolitinib arm. Maybe it had to do with the complete hematologic remissions. Maybe it is the, the control of the white count. Um, the one silent point here, which is uh, obvious, but maybe not appreciated by the community physicians, it's this is not a spleen drug. You don't have to have a big spleen for the drug to work. The same in myelofibrosis. Almost all the studies had the requirement for myelofibrosis patients to have a big spleen. Response study that led to approval of ruxolitinib in PV had a requirement for big spleen, but you pointed out very well the follow-up study response two did not uh, mandate that. In fact, were excluding patients with big spleen. That's a second-line PV study, and the response in the control of the symptoms and the blood cell count was the same as in, in the patients with the spleen. So spleen, yes or no, in PV doesn't really matter. Activity is there for the symptoms and the blood cell count.